Good evening. On behalf of Chancellor Rick Caulfield and Provost Karen Carey, I would also like to welcome you to the UAS Evening at Egan's Lecture Series. As Angie stated, my name is Maren Havig and I serve as the Associate Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences. Tonight's program will be led by Dr. David Noon, Professor of History. Dave has been on the UAS faculty since 2002, teaching a range of courses in U.S. history. He recently completed a sabbatical focused on violence, popular culture, and the American presidency. His talk tonight is titled, The Gothic Executive, Images of Presidential Violence in American Popular Culture from Andrew Jackson to Donald Trump. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Noon. So they offered me a headset in case I wanted to roam around, but then I felt that would look kind of like a TED talk, so I turned the headset down. So I'll stay pretty much rooted in place here uh, as, we, as we go through a whole bunch of slides and uh, however much material I, I, I feel like inflicting on you. We'll, we'll see how long this goes. I, I'll, pl I'll plan to talk for about an hour and then we'll, we'll, we'll chat. Um, so first of all, yeah, this was my sabbatical project, which was off to a, a, a roaring uh, start uh, until February 13th when the governor's budget proposal dropped, uh, which was like the, the, the needle screeching across the record so far as uh, work getting done. But, uh, but I managed to, to recover a little bit. So uh, it, was, it was certainly an interesting year. Um, this project is something I've been working on here and there for roughly five years uh, or so. It started with some work I was doing on images of Abraham Lincoln in popular literature, particularly some kind of unusual white supremacist literature at the end of the 19th century that kind of paradoxically enough or counterintuitively enough uh, celebrated Abraham Lincoln. I became interested in other depictions of Lincoln in popular culture and uh, stumbled, as many folks uh, have, across the Abraham Lincoln vampire hunter novel and film, which came out roughly a decade ago. Uh, so I, I wrote some about that. And as I, as I was, began thinking about this kind of unusual uh, characterization of Lincoln as an axe-wielding, vampire-slaying, uh, you know, national avenger, I, I started asking questions, well, you know, what does this all mean just in terms of Lincoln's image? But uh, it quickly occurred to me that there are a lot of images of presidents doing violent things in our popular culture, stretching all the way back to conversations about the Constitution and the executive. So that's, that's kind of the, you know, the genesis of, of this project. Um, the title uh, is not going to necessarily reflect everything I'm going to talk about tonight. The, 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 the Gothic Executive is the title of the, um, the overall uh, project that I'm, I'm working on. And, and the only thing we really need to keep in mind if we're thinking about Gothic themes is that Gothic literature uh, is obsessed with decay and ruin. Uh, it is uh, uh, obsessed with landscapes in which uh, deformities and monstrosities uh, are everywhere. And, and the Gothic uh, kind of invites uh, either a, a sense of despair or a sense of adventure. And, and in some ways, those are kind of two of the emotional poles that I'm interested in thinking about when it, when it comes to representations of presidents in popular culture. Images of presidents as heroic saviors of a nation that is uh, tending toward doom for one reason or another, or even more darkly, presidents who are themselves responsible for uh, delivering the nation into, in, into darkness. Um, I'm not going to talk a, a whole lot about Donald Trump, but we can in <laughs> question and answer. This is, there's a lot. I mean, it, this, this is a project that spans, you know, a, a whole lot of material from the 1820s through, uh, you know, last week. Uh, so we're going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to telescope a lot of things. I'll spend a little bit of time uh, kind of on a, a couple little case studies looking at uh, Andrew Jackson and uh, Theodore Roosevelt. But, uh, but I want to start just by making a couple of broad observations. One of which is that we have to think about the presidency not merely as a constitutional institution, something that is structured by our framework of government, something that has a whole array of rules 
uh, that kind of bind it. But we also have to think about the presidency as a cultural institution. We make meaning about the presidency, not just particular individuals who inhabit or in aspire to inhabit the presidency, uh, but we rely on a whole lot of mediated technologies, film, literature, popular song, political cartoons, uh, a lot of visual uh, as well as imaginative um, uh, influences uh, we can identify in, in uh, kind of thinking about how we, uh, how we imagine the, the, the presidency. So it's a, it's a cultural institution. Um, cultural studies of the presidency have spent a lot of time looking at those different media over the years. And certainly in the years to come, we're going to have to contend with the dizzying consequences of social media, particularly in the era of and after Donald Trump, who has harnessed Twitter and Facebook and other platforms uh, to fuel his grievance-driven uh, persona. So in a way, I'm kind of trying to add to uh, this, this scholarship. Contemporary American popular culture is, to understate the matter, littered with images of presidents uh, behaving uh, graphically, violently. In, in recent years, as I've already alluded to, we have novelists who have uh, commodified images of Abraham Lincoln as a vampire hunter. Uh, we have political cartoonists who have uh, outfitted Barack Obama as a, a superhero uh, or alternately as uh, the Joker. We have political cartoons that have depicted George W. Bush as a medieval torturer. I'm not gonna spend much time on Bush, but we can come back to that later if we prefer. Uh, we've also got, from a couple decades prior to George W. Bush, we have Ronald Reagan, who was frequently depicted as a reckless custodian of nuclear weapons. I have a whole chapter on presidents and nuclear weapons, uh, and so some of these images are drawn from that. Uh, or, alternately, uh, images of Reagan as Rambo. Um, this, is, this takes some of you. That, that, po that Ronbo poster I had forgotten about was real popular in the, the mid-1980s. Uh, uh, and we've got a, a, an array of artists, varying abilities and commercial flair, who've uh, imagined pulpish kinds of uh, carnivalesque encounters between different presidents. So here we've got Theodore Roosevelt fighting Sasquatch. Uh, we have uh, Thomas Jefferson armed with his left fist and the Declaration of Independence fighting a, a silverback gorilla here. And uh, this is George Washington, of course, uh, fending off a, a horde of, of zombies. Uh, we've got Donald Trump here slaying a dragon. Um, this cartoon is Ben Garrison is a real piece of work. But these images, uh, you know, extend far beyond what we often think of as, as kind of conventional political mem me uh, uh, images or, or metaphors. We're used to thinking about politics as, as a, a form of pugilism. Uh, and there's a lot to be said about the history of politics represented as a boxing match. This is one of the earliest images uh, that fits into that slot. This is, uh, of course, Andrew Jackson shirtless as we've always wanted him to be on the right, uh, fighting, uh, I believe this is, uh, that's Nicholas Biddle, this is a depiction of the, uh, the bank war of, of the, the early uh, 1830s. Uh, so Jackson as a, as a political combatant. But the, the images that I, I just showed you and some of the ones that I'm working on in this, this project extend far beyond those conventional metaphors. We gotta think about some of the sources of these images. And basically, as I've already indicated, there, there's a couple of polarities here. Some of these images emerge from a place of, of, of whimsy. You know, Jefferson fighting a silverback gorilla is just fun. Uh, we can talk about why those images might be possible to imagine at this particular historical and cultural moment, uh, but it's, it's whimsical. Uh, other images of presidents doing violent things come from a place of civic alarm. So the image of George Bush as a torturer obviously reflects some, some deep anxieties about the, uh, the policies that the Bush administration was pursuing with respect to uh, detainee treatment in the, the mid-aughts. Um, other sources of these images come from outrage or condemnation of sp specific presidents and, and, and particular uh, policies. Uh, 
Um, but I want to start with a brawl, or at least an imagined brawl, and I'm going to uh, take you to Reddit here. This is a post from sometime in, in August of 2012. There were a couple of uh, pseudonymous posters uh, who offered up this, this hypothetical on the, 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 the subreddit historical what if. Uh, which is a, a conversation board that's usually devoted to questions like, well, what happens if John Adams wins the election of 1800? What happens if Julius Caesar survives his assassination? And then nerds descend and debate what the outcomes of these counterfactual scenarios might be. So in August of 2012, these two guys post this hypothetical, in a mass knife fight to the death between every American president, who would win and why? Most of the comments on this subreddit usually number in the single to low double digits. It's not a frenzy of commentary. This post, however, picked up steam, not just on Reddit, where it accumulated hundreds of comments, but then the very same debate metastasized onto blogs and in other areas of electronic media. And it would be really impossible to tally the number of comments and the, the volume of, of interest that this particular question uh, in, inspired. Um, so it was, it was an unusual uh, uh, kind of thing. The, the guys who, who created the scenario had a couple of rules, uh, the, the fairly simple. Uh, every combatant had to be in the best shape of his presidential career, so it wasn't Andrew Jackson as a young man, it was Andrew Jackson between 1829 and 1837. Uh, so they had to be in the, some kind of physical condition that was present during their uh, their term in office. They were uh, allowed no tools or weapons other than a single combat knife. They were all allowed one combat knife. The only allowance w was made for Franklin Roosevelt, who was allowed to have a motorized uh, wheelchair. A little bit of a, an, 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 uh, an anachronism there. The presidents could have no specialized training beyond what they had already received. If they had military service, they could make use of that, but they weren't allowed to you know, advance their skills in order to participate in this. Only one president would emerge from the end. This was a knife fight to the death. There would only be one survivor. Uh, the battle, which would take place in a concrete enclosed arena, roughly the size of the Roman Colosseum, would continue the posters determined, quote, as long as it needs to. And as I said, over the next couple of weeks and then the months and years to come, this question would continue to be uh, revisited. There's a fellow named Jeffrey Mix, who's a Canadian uh, writer. Um, he uh, reposted this same question and garnered about 600 comments, as well as over 100,000 page views for this blog post. So that Reddit post quickly sort of, uh, sort of took a, a step to the side. And, and Jeff Mix became really the um, uh, kind of ground zero for this, this commentary. About five years later, in 2017, Vice News produced a couple minute animated uh, a coverage of, of Mix's post, uh, an animated version of his original post. By 2018, there was a presidential knife fight card game uh, that, was, that was available. Um, and beyond that, the idea of a presidential brawl has become almost ubiquitous in uh, our kind of the margins of our political uh, culture. It's been revisited uh, countless times on Reddit. The same question has come up. New York Times covered the debate in a, a broader piece about how to evaluate presidential uh, greatness. Um, some of these conversations where, where some of these cultural moments were very narrowly tailored to particular presidential con, con, uh, contests. So we here we've got um, uh, you know, Mitt Romney squaring off against a variety of Republican contenders in, in 2012. This is from Slate Magazine, which had an ongoing series called uh, Political Combat uh, 12, which was sort of an allusion to the video game, the classic video game franchise, Mortal Kombat, spelled with a K. Um, Epic Games, which was a um, app developer in North Carolina, took that concept a step further. Also, again, the 2012 election, and uh, pr released an actual fighting game that you could play on your phones. It was called Vote. 
with three exclamation points after it. Uh, and it pitted Romney and Obama against each other in a variety of presidential scenarios. They could fight on the debate stage, they could fight on the Oval Office, the South Lawn of the White House. Uh, they put the swing in swing state by clubbing each other with sublethal weapons, microphones, hot dogs, ice cream cones, and, and so on. Uh, we have other electronic entrepreneurs who produced similar kinds of gimmicks. Uh, here we have a, a really crude fighting game that was supposedly going to be produced by a small Las Vegas-based uh, developer. It was going to be called the Battle for the, uh, the Presidency, but it never actually uh, was released. But what, what, they, what they promised is that they would take, uh, as they put it, United States presidents and current running candidates, buff them out, tap them up, modernize their appearance, and stick them in a setting of your choice to fight to see who was really the greatest, um, and so on and so forth. We have a, 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 almost an endless array of variations on this theme of presidential candidates uh, beating each other up. There was a book put out by one of the editors of uh, Cracked Magazine, Daniel O'Brien, uh, How to Fight Presidents, um, featuring chapters titled, quote, Teddy Roosevelt will speak softly and beat the shit out of you. <laughs> so uh, for the kids, including my 10-year-old son, uh, there was a somewhat sanitized version of this called Your Presidential Fantasy Dream Team, which likewise consisted of short jaunty biographies of presidents highlighting their fighting abilities and their fighting deficits um, and asked young readers to assemble a dream team of presidential candidates that would be their attack squad that, that, that would defend the nation from a swarm of robot invaders from uh, outer space. Uh, the chapters, as I said, were kind of toned down. Instead of Roosevelt will speak softly and beat the shit out of you, it was Roosevelt is the best, you know, sort of a disappointing alternative. Uh, even presidential historians got in on the game here. There was a podcast series by uh, an American historian appropriately named Scott Rank uh, and a, a colleague of his who for 44 episodes kind of worked their way through an NCAA style bracket. Each week it was so-and-so against so-and-so and then they would have you know, uh, talk about the presidents and, and their fighting abilities and their leadership qualities for about eight to ten minutes, then they decide who win the fight, and then they go back next week and, and, and do it all again. Um, so, so these are just, uh, again, we, we could continue with this kind of stuff forever. It's, it's, it's all over the place. Uh, as I said earlier, anyone who's loosely familiar with the metaphors that we use to describe American politics wouldn't find this particularly uh, uh, surprising fists, knives, and other weapons of small-scale destruction have been not just metaphorically placed in American politics, but we have a long history of actual fighting that's, that's gone on. Uh, here, uh, on the right-hand side, we have a, a, a book by an American historian named Joanne Freeman. It's a remarkable book uh, called Field of Blood, which is about actual congressional fist fights, duels, and other scrums that took place in the decades leading up to the Civil War. So Freeman looks at the way that interpersonal violence really helps to pave the way for sectional bloodletting uh, a couple of decades later. But we've had fights in Congress before. On uh, the, the top left side, we have a famous attack that takes place in 1798 during John Adams's presidency, a fight between Roger Griswold of Connecticut uh, and Matthew Lyon, who I believe was uh, from Vermont. Um, they were basically fighting. It was an offshoot of political wrangling over the Alien and Sedition Acts. Uh, and then on the bottom, we have the famous attack on Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner in May of 1866 when he was clubbed uh, by a North Carolina congressman uh, named Preston Brooks. So the, 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 the actual violence that has marked our politics from time to time, of course, is accompanied by metaphorical violence that we uh, have, have come to uh, recognize as just sort of an obvious part of how we, uh, how we think, about, uh, think about our politics. Um, 
If you think about the fight club metaphor, though, there are some more contemporary cultural reference, most obviously the novel by Chuck Palahniuk and the film that was produced a couple years later directed by David Fincher, Fight Club, uh, is the, the obvious reference point for, uh, for a lot of these. And I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to belabor uh, the plot of Fight Club, but, uh, but essentially it's about it's a, you know, fraternal bonding. It's a group of men who substitute uh, underground illegal boxing clubs uh, for therapy and self-improvement. They, they, they reject the, the, the culture of self-improvement uh, and they embark on sort of this, this nihilistic project of, of, of beating each other uh, uh, to, uh, to pulps. But what's, what's interesting about that film is that everyone who is a part of this project, which in the novel and the film is known as Project Mayhem, is anonymous. They have no names. In fact, it's very clear. It's, it's part of the rules of this this club, this project, when you enter into it, you surrender your identity. The only character who does not, however, is Tyler Durden, who is played by Brad Pitt and who is, in a sense, the founding father. Uh, it's not a, no, not a surprise that if you get on the internet and you do Google searches for Tyler Durden and president, you can find all kinds of paraphernalia, fake T-shirts, fake presidential campaign buttons, bumper stickers, all proclaiming uh, the, their support for uh, Tyler Durden for, uh, uh, for president. A if you look at the, the ways that Fight Club has sort of overlapped with presidential represent representations, of course, you've got Abraham Lincoln, uh, who appears in the video game. Uh, you can fight as Abraham Lincoln, or you can fight Abraham Lincoln in the Fight Club video game. There are artists who have taken some of the images from that film uh, and reworked Abraham Lincoln as Brad Pitt, uh, or on the left-hand corner you got George Washington and a variety of other founders who are um, recast in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the film. So, uh, so some, some interesting stuff there related to contemporary culture, but I want to I back up a little bit uh, and go to the nation's founding, now that we've talked about Tyler Durden as a kind of founding father. I want to think about the cultural perceptions, the fantasies, and the fears that were associated with the presidential office from the very beginning, um, because I think that also conditions it. So essentially part of my argument here is that we've got a, a baseline, a, a kind of a consistent stream of frameworks for thinking about the presidency, uh, this, this dialectic of fear and admiration for the violence that might be at the disposal of whoever holds that office. Uh, so that's, that's kind of a consistent structure that we can see throughout various periods of American history. But the, the manifestation and the representation of those fears is going to take on particular coloration depending on the historical moment and depending on some of the cultural texts that are being alluded to. So Fight Club is an example of kind of an inflection of a very specific uh, point in time on these, these kinds of anxieties and, and fears. But if we look at the founding era and the discourse about the presidency and the Constitution, we can see that Republican thinkers, Republican with a small r, in the late 18th century were profoundly concerned about the collapse of social order uh, and very concerned that the new nation could be overwhelmed by uh, violence. They worried about internal uprisings, they worried about revolts launched by, this was not supposed to go to sleep. But apparently it did. So I'll continue talking while I hope someone comes up and figures out why the computer just went to sleep. Um, so uh, anxieties about internal uprisings, worries about uh, farmer revolts, uh, which a rural uh, dissent, which was uh, quite common uh, throughout the, uh, the 1780s and into the early 1790s. Uh, they were worried uh, as well about external uh, disruption, uh, invasions by foreign adversaries like the French or the Spanish. Uh, they were concerned about Indian uprisings. They were concerned about slave revolts. Uh, they were concerned about audiovisual malfunctions. 
indeed. As soon as we can. Um. Anyone have any questions on what we covered so far? <laughs> We'll wait till the end here. Well, I, I will keep going, awkward though it may be. Um, uh, so there's, there's this concern about violence from below. There's concern about violence from outside. But there's also concern about violence from above manifested in uh, tyranny, yes. uh, authority. Here we go. Perfect. So great. Uh, so. The, the world of the 18th century was all wrapped up in concerns about conspiracies, cabals. Uh, there were a, a variety of, of uh, uh, ways in which this, which this manifested itself. But if you look at the revolutionary period, uh, one of the focus, uh, one of the foci of those anxieties about conspiracies centered on increasingly on the king and uh, royal authority so if you if you look at the discourse about the the stamp act for example you can find people like sam adams uh, uh describing the stamp act as being like quote like the sword nero wished for uh, to have decollated the roman people in a single stroke uh, those who complained about British policy tallied up the encroachments on individual liberties, the undue burdens placed on them by colonial courts and assemblies, uh, as well as to the obvious violence that was committed in the name of restoring order to the colonies after 1775. Increasingly, as I said, the focus of these complaints centers on the king. If you examine the Declaration of Independence or the draft, which uh, you know we saw earlier in Jefferson's hands as he was clubbing a, uh, a gorilla, you can see it's it's really a, it's a bill of indictments, a, a restraining order of sorts uh, against the monstrous predations of the crown. Uh, it lists the quote injuries inflicted by George the Third himself, uh, among other things, the Declaration of Independence. Uh, warns that, uh, that, that uh, royal officials are bent upon annihilation of liberty, uh, that there are swarms of royal officers who threaten to, quote, eat out the people's substance. And these are all phrases from the Declaration of Independence. So you think about that image earlier of Washington mowing down zombies, it looks kind of goofy, but then when you look at the language of the Declaration of Independence, and it really anticipates some of the, 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 the gothic themes that we associate with, uh, with zombie films. Uh, the Declaration of Independence contended that the king had, quote, protected murderers with phony courts. It noted that he had dissolved colonial legislatures that had, quote, opposed with manly firmness his invasions upon the rights of the people. It railed against a monarch who, quote, plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. So there's a lot of violent imagery loaded into the Declaration of Independence. Uh, and it sounds, sounds alarm, especially, over the way that the king had supposedly solicited alien forces and racial others as co-conspirators against the liberty and the security of once loyal subjects. Uh, to, quote, complete the work of death, desolation, and tyranny, Jefferson wrote, this enthroned beast had, quote, dispatched large armies of foreign mercenaries, German soldiers, in other words, who had acted with cruelty and perfidy, scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages. Moreover, Jefferson concludes, the king had inspired domestic insurrections among us, slave revolts, in other words, as, as well as recruiting merciless Indian savages to carry out the, quote, undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions of existence. Uh, so looked at in that light, the Declaration of Independence is, is a pretty graphic account of uh, a, a king and a tyrant who had, uh, all, you know, gravely threatened uh, the liberties of the people. Other areas of revolutionary discourse assigned Caesar-like or Nero-like qualities to the king. Uh, if, if there was a Godwin's Law in the 18th century, and if you're not familiar with Godwin's Law, it's the rule that any online conversation, the longer it goes on, the likelihood that it will involve a reference to, uh, to 
I was going to say Abraham Lincoln, Adolf Hitler, um, approaches one. The longer a conversation, the longer an argument takes place, the, the more likely it is you're going to get a reference to uh, Adolf Hitler. Well, in the 18th century, that would have been Caesar or Nero. So there's a lot of references to Caesar and Nero in these kinds of uh, uh, these kinds of, of, of conversations. Uh, and that's, th that really helps to frame the, the, the disposition that new American citizens and subjects took toward the office of the presidency as it was de being debated in the aftermath of the Philadelphia Convention in 1787. The, 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 the arguments about the Constitution really focused heavily on the executive. Those who opposed the Constitution raised all these specters from the American Revolution. They said this is going to be a monarch in utero, the, the fetus of tyranny, as it was, was sometimes called. Um, they, they worried that the office of the presidency would invite people with Caesarian aspirations and that uh, it would inevitably lead to the destruction of the Republic. Those who celebrated the presidency, people like Alexander Hamilton, who wrote the three Federalist Papers in support of the presidency, used kind of heroic or, or you know, uh, celebratory language uh, to explain why this office was necessary. Hamilton argues essentially that you need a stronger executive. You need what he called energy uh, in the office because the president was going to have to deal with a variety of very material threats to the republic. The president was going to have to be able to act decisively on behalf of the nation's security and for those reasons you need an enhanced uh, executive. You need an, an office with a lot of, of power behind it. Hamilton goes on to promise, however, that the office of the presidency will always be filled with the most noble of creatures, uh, that there, there, won't be any, there won't be any problems with that. And he specifically argues that the Electoral College will guarantee that only the best rise to uh, the presidency. Um, so those words are, are always uh, ironic. Um, uh, so if you again, if you look at these these debates, you'll see people saying, "Do we want do we want a new king? Do we want a new monarch? Uh, do we want to have a despot?" Uh, there were comparisons between the office of the president and mythological creatures like the Hydra. Uh, do you want a Hydra uh, in uh, the nation's uh, highest office? Uh, do you want an infernal junto of demagogues authoring a conspiracy against the freedom of America? That's a quotation from a, an opponent of the Constitution who raised this kind of monstrous uh, specter in order to, to rally support against it. Um, so, so again, those are, those are sort of like very early on kind of the, the poles around which the imagination, the cultural construction of the office is going to take place. Uh, so, so once more, I'm arguing that it's not just that we're debating structures, we're also debating uh, meaning here. So uh, a couple of, of case studies and then we can, uh, you know, wind things toward question and, and, and answer. Uh, if we're talking about presidential violence, the obvious place to begin is with Andrew Jackson. Uh, Jackson was, without question, the most violent individual who has ever held office. We have plenty of presidents who have killed people, uh, presidents who have served in times of war, a lot of folks aren't aware of the fact that Grover Cleveland, who had two non-consecutive presidential terms in the uh, 1880s and early 1890s, uh, Grover Cleveland, when he was mayor of Buffalo, was the executioner uh, in several uh, cases where uh, criminals were hanged. Uh, Cleveland believed that he couldn't shirk that responsibility, that he had to be the one to drop the, drop the lever. Um, so we, we, and of course, you probably remember when uh, George W. Bush was running for the presidency in 2000, a lot of people made a big deal about the fact that as governor of Texas, he had provi presided over a, a staggering uh, list of, of executions, uh, some of which were, you know, uh, it received international attention like the execution of, of Carla Faye Tucker. Uh, 
uh, whose pleas for mercy uh, Bush actually mocked in an interview with uh, uh, Tucker Carlson um, back in sometime in sometime around the election of, of 2000. So we have presidents who have have, have killed people. We have presidents who who have uh, violence in their past, but we've got Andrew Jackson sort of at the at the top of the list. Uh, Jackson's presidency coincides with the birth of popular politics. It's an era not only in which presidential campaigns became popular affairs associated with uh, parades, uh, uh, partisan literature, magazines that uh, try to you know rally support for one candidate or another. It's an era in which popular song starts to become associated with uh, presidential uh, figures. So Jackson is there at the birth of popular politics and as you know, a, a, an expression of numerous forms of violence in the early republic, he helps to fuse that, um, that relationship between popular culture uh, and violence. Jackson's biography, as some of you are probably aware, was pretty, pretty rough hewn. He was a, a, an orphan uh, at a young age. He brawled with personal and political enemies, and I've lost the, uh, the screen here again, which is delightful. Um, so we can't see the duel that I was about to, uh, uh, to reference. Uh, he, he brawled with political enemies. Uh, he killed one guy in a duel in 1806. He was involved in numerous precursors to duels, uh, duels that never quite made it to you know, the, the final scene, which was typical of most duels in the, uh, uh, the 19th century. He led armies against Great Britain uh, as well as Spain in the era around the War of 1812. Uh, overlapping with those campaigns against the British and the Spanish, he dislodged native peoples uh, from their homelands and uh, imposed martial law on the city of New Orleans in the aftermath of the battle that uh, sort of concludes the, the, the War of 1812. He executed soldiers for mutiny and desertion. And in an illegal invasion that he undertook in Spanish Florida in uh, 1818, he um, uh, wound up executing uh, two British nationals that he accused of uh, uh, espionage. So when it came time for Jackson to begin poking around national office, those violent aspects of his biography served his supporters as well as his detractors. Jackson's endorsers pointed to his heroic defense of the city of New Orleans. Uh, they pointed to his exploits on the battlefield. Uh, those who were wary of Andrew Jackson, who imagined him as a Caesar in waiting, uh, pointed very nervously uh, to uh, those exploits. A couple words about uh, both sides of that. Um, Jackson's victory in New Orleans in uh, January of uh, 1815 was celebrated in poetry, it was celebrated in song. Jackson's, I suppose, unofficial campaign song was called The, the Hunters of Kentucky, uh, which was a, a, a famous song in the 19th century. It started as kind of a uh, vaudeville's the wrong term, but it was a, it was a popular tune that got reworked into an ode uh, to uh, Andrew Jackson. Um, my favorite example of pro-Jackson literature during these years was a, 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 an anonymous poem released in 1827 called An Epic Poem in Commemoration of General Andrew Jackson's Victory on the 8th of January, 1815. It was a 30-page hyperbolic account of the Battle of New Orleans, which ends with visions of, quote, the Mississippi swelled with curdling blood, bursting its banks with human gore as the sky shatters with, quote, mad lightnings, red thunders, and a whirlwind tempest that casts the British forever from American shores. You can easily imagine this reworked into a, um, you know, uh, one of the images that I saw, saw earlier. Uh, but as I said, Jackson's victory at New Orleans was not celebrated without reservation. Uh, there were many who argued that Jackson was 
someone who could only, quote, dwell on blood and carnage with any composure, um, and that uh, his, his detractors warned that Jackson's obsession with bloodshed and his, uh, his history of presiding over carnage uh, indicated some dangerous uh, tendencies in his character. They pointed in particular to the imposition of martial law over New Orleans, both before and after the battle. Uh, they reminded Americans that when Jackson invaded Florida, uh, that he contradicted official orders from the president at the time, who was uh, James Monroe. Um, the subplot there is that Monroe actually gave him sort of a wink and a nod to go ahead and do it, but officially the policy was we're not going to invade Spanish Florida. Uh, Jackson went ahead and did it anyway. And for that, he was condemned, not just at the time, but for the rest of his life. Uh, anytime someone wanted to score a couple of points against Andrew Jackson, they would point out the fact that he launched an, inv an illegal invasion of Spanish Florida. So it was compared not only to Caesar, but there were other reference now available like uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. During his presidential campaigns in 1824 and 1828, the anti-Jacksonian press dredged up all this stuff. They paid particular attention to his, quote, intemperate life and character, to quote one pamphleteer. Uh, this same pamphleteer claimed to have a list of, quote, nearly 100 fights or violent or abusive quarrels that were instigated by Jackson. They had, so they had like a laundry list of things that Jackson had done. Others accused him of inhumanity toward ordinary soldiers. Uh, during the 1828 contest, supporters of the incumbent president, John Quincy Adams, circulated any number of pamphlets and handbills detailing Andrew Jackson's crimes. One of these is the coffin handbill, which if we get our, our AV back, I can, I can show you one example of that details, quote, the bloody deeds of General Jackson. Uh, and as we'll see, there are coffins, there are silhouettes of coffins that ring the, uh, the handbill. Uh, there are poems about one of these poor deserters who just wanted to go home to his farm, but uh, for his crime of abandoning his post in the middle of the night, uh, Jackson had him killed. Um, so, so there was an obsession in the anti-Jacksonian literature with his, his personal uh, crimes against um, uh, soldiers. A um, lot of that kind of stuff going on. The most prolific anti-Jacksonian was a Cincinnati newspaper who was named Charles Hammond. He produced a newspaper called The Monthly Anti-Jackson Expositor which ran from January to, I was a brief run, uh, January to October 1828. It was just there as a, as a campaign, uh, uh, kind of, a, a, you know, a venue for anti-Jacksonian propaganda. And it was just a relentless stream of bile issuing from Hammond's pages. Um, it, uh, it, it was a, a, a glorious thing. But one of the, one of the, um, a text that appears in there is a, a campaign song uh, f on behalf of John Quincy Adams. And it, it was set to a, a traditional Scottish uh, muster tune called Little What You What's Coming, or Little Know You What's Coming. And Hammond altered the lyrics, and I'll, I'll give you some of the lyrics here. It, it's, a, it's a variation on the theme, vote for our candidate or our adversary is going to get you all killed. So the poem details all the problems that are going to come if Jackson is, is victorious. Uh, murder with gory hands are coming. Fires are coming. Swords are coming. Pistols, guns, and knives are coming. Martial and lynch law are coming. Slavery's coming. Blunder's coming. Robin's coming. Jobin's coming. And the plague of war is coming if John Quincy not be coming. Um, so this, again, not, not the last presidential campaign to suggest that world-ending violence might ensue if the wrong candidate were uh, elected. Uh, of course, Jackson did prevail in 1828, and although the nation didn't collapse into the plague of war that Hammond uh, promised, it was a highly polarized era. Jackson continued to 
shape popular views of presidential character and fitness. Uh, Jackson's supporters celebrated his assaults on the National Bank, which I've got more images here we'll eventually get around to. Uh, I, I invoke that image of the Hydra. Uh, folks saying in the constitutional debates, uh, um, I'll start there. Okay, so this is the coffin handbill. Should I just like keep touching no, this it, to keep it, it, it from? This okay, way. perfect, excellent. Um, so here's the coffin handbill. So you see, there's there's you know reminders of Jackson's lethal um, deeds everywhere. Uh, here's a pro Jackson image. Uh, so rather than the president becoming a Hydra, which was some. Some opponents of the Constitution uh, feared that, that he would. Uh, here you have Jackson fighting the Hydra. In the 19th century, the Hydra was a real common political image. Uh, you know, today we've got vampires, we've got werewolves, we've got zombies. But in the 19th century, the Hydra served that purpose. The Hydra happened to be one of the uh, part of one of the uh, what Hercules, what do they call it, his, his travails or his toils, his, the deeds and tasks of, of Hercules. So to depict um, Andrew Jackson or anyone else fighting a hydra was to link them to a, a, a mythological reference that all Americans would have been aware of. This is, this is Hercules. Uh, Jackson also um, was associated with another of Hercules tasks, which was to sweep out the Augean stables. Um, King Augeas had these like enormous, um, I think they were oxen, or some, some kind of cattle, and they were just like kind of, kind of littering the stables with, with feces, and one of Hercules' tasks was to clean up all of this, this like, you know, ox shit. So the, the image of the, of the broom became associated with Andrew Jackson. Jackson cleaning out the Augean stables was a metaphor for him coming in and cleaning out corruption um, or draining the swamp to use a more contemporary uh, reference. So you see, so Hercules was a pretty important figure, a superhero of, of sorts. Um, so for those who saw Jackson as a monster on the other side, there were those who celebrated Jackson as a, as a Herculean. Uh, uh, kind of character. Um, but of course, again, the, the, the polarities can always be reversed. And as, as Jackson did things like squash the National Bank, uh, as, as he engaged in, in other activities that struck his opponents as, as, as dangerously uh, engorged with power, you get a, another famous image, this uh, uh, representation of Andrew Jackson as King Andrew the First, uh, born to command, and you may not be able to see the, um, uh, the the lettering at the bottom there, but he's standing on the Constitution. Um, uh, you, you can find lots of images of, of presidents or other political figures, you know, treading on the Constitution or defacing or dismembering the Constitution. Uh, this was one of the first examples uh, uh, of that. So both of these views, Jackson as a monster, Jackson as a king, Jackson as a slayer of monsters, uh, depend upon this understanding that Jackson was an agent of violence, either on behalf of the nation or as a threat to the republic. Um, and, and the hero or menace, however he was imagined, uh, Jackson's popularity has always hinged on these, these themes of violence. Um, one thing that I find interesting, at least in Jackson's contemporary historical moment, there wasn't a whole lot of popular cultural in, interest or representation of Jackson um, expropriating Indian land or presiding over the expulsion of various tribes from the, the southeast. That's you know, obviously a, a connection that we can make between Jackson and violence, but it wasn't one that was really visible. Con that was not really a conspicuous part of the Jacksonian imagery from his own time period. Uh, so if you're wondering why I haven't brought that up in, in much detail, uh, that's partly, uh, partly why. Those, those are, you know, more contemporary uh, 
kind of images that we have of, of Jackson. And again, we can talk about that later. Um, okay, moving on to our, our next little case study here. Uh, we've got another president who is forever linked in various ways with violence. This is Theodore Roosevelt. Now, Roosevelt, very different character than Andrew Jackson. Um, Roosevelt did not grow up in a world that was as violent as the one that Jackson grew up in, or at least Roosevelt's personal upbringing was not nearly as violent as, as that which uh, defined uh, Jackson. But nevertheless, Roosevelt was a performer, and he remade himself numerous times using some of the, the violent resources or the, the resources of cultural uh, images of violence at his disposal. So he tapped into the mythology of the frontier. He crafted himself as a Western cowboy. Uh, he was an aggressive nationalist uh, and, and the years before his presidency as well as during his presidency, uh, he was eager to expand the, the political and economic as well as the territorial and cultural domain of the United States. Uh, Roosevelt was also an apologist for Indian removal. If you look at his historical writings, Roosevelt was easily the most literary president we've ever had. He's got a multi-volume history of the American West, and he more or less excuses the policies that Jackson himself had um, uh, helped to, to initiate. Like Jackson, Roosevelt's image cut in a couple of different directions. His violent pastimes, his defensive imperialism, his brief career as a military officer helped to cast him for some as a tough-minded leader who would fight on behalf of the people, uh, but his critics also had ample evidence at their disposal to criticize him as a menace uh, to the nation. Roosevelt was not an orphan. As I said, he's not part of the same kind of world that Jackson grew up in. Roosevelt was a patrician. He was uh, born into a, a, a well-established uh, family, a lot of material comfort at his disposal. He was a sickly child. He was plagued by asthma and an almost constant stream of gastrointestinal afflictions. He turned repeatedly to violent pastimes in order to fashion himself into a more robust young man. So he took an interest in things like natural history. So he, he became really enthusiastic about um, the po like children's, like literature for youth that was all about hunting big game. Um, he read about you know, frontier heroes shooting cougars and wrestling bears. He acquired his first gun at the age of 14 and embarked on a lifelong enthusiasm for hunting that remains one of Roosevelt's defining uh, character traits. He pursued a regimen of physical transformation. His father encouraged him to remake his body uh, into what Roosevelt in his autobiography described as a tough nut. So he boxed. He lifted weights, he trained himself to be like the men that he admired in his readings. He sought to be a war hero. He looked for opportunities to relive or live out these daydreams of glory that, uh, that he had read about. He credited boxing for transforming him into a virile young man, as he puts it, as stout and able a fighting man as my Norse ancestors. So he takes up boxing. And when he gets into politics in the 1880s, he brought those kinds of pugilistic instincts with him. He earned a reputation as being a, an aggressive legislator with a tornado-like uh, energy. One of his fellow legislators described him in, in Albany as being, quote, just like a jack coming out of the box. There wasn't anything cool about him. He yelled and pounded his desk. And when they attacked him, he would fire back with all the venom imaginable. Um, political men, Jackson argued, needed to be vigorous in mind and body, able to hold out their own in rough conflict with our fellows, able to suffer punishment without flinching, and at need to repay it in kind with full interest. Uh, so Jackson, or rather Roosevelt, relied on those, those uh, conventional images of uh, violence in politics. He abandoned politics 
fairly early on in 1884. He set out to remake himself again into an emblem of frontier manhood. He published several books on that experience, a lot of memoirs. Uh, he wrote, as I mentioned, this three-volume history of the American West, which celebrates the subjection of Indian people, which he describes as weaker and wholly alien. Uh, he lamented the violence that accompanied that settler expansion, but he excused them as being, quote, the birth pangs of a new and vigorous uh, people. So Roosevelt had this vision of racial conquest. Uh, he, by the 1880s and 1890s, was joining other enthusiastic nationalists in uh, promoting the cause of American empire in the Pacific as well as in the Caribbean. So he celebrated a new era of expansion to kind of uh, extend the era that he had written about in his, his own work. He transforms himself again for a third time by becoming an officer at the advanced age of, I think, 38. He, uh, he joins up with the 1st Volunteer Regiment and uh, uh, becomes a Rough Rider. That led, of course, to um, his selection uh, as a candidate for uh, governor of um, uh, New York, and that led uh, eventually to the vice presidency and then following the assassination of uh, William McKinley in the fall of 1901 to the presidency itself. So, so, so Roosevelt has these, these reservoirs of kind of, you know, violent imagery at his disposal, and cartoonists and other depictors of political culture at the time ate that up. Roosevelt was a, a, a celebrity long before he became a politician. Well, he was a politician first, and then a celebrity, and then a politician uh, again. So he was, he was really ready-made for this kind of you know, popular culture uh, of the late 19th century. Uh, one historian described Roosevelt as a, a cartoonist's dream come true. Drawing the president became a national pastime. Uh, the energy that Roosevelt brought into political life was frequently portrayed in the language of boxing, martial arts, cowboy lore, hunting, and, and so forth. Uh, when Roosevelt comes into office, again, you've got a, a ready-made set of images here, like the image of Jackson fighting the Hydra. Uh, here you've got Roosevelt uh, fighting a Hydra of his own. Uh, in this case, he's attempting to defeat um, uh, adversaries within his own party, sort of waging a campaign against uh, stalwart Republicans who are resisting his efforts to, uh, uh, to bring reform uh, to the Republic. We are certainly familiar, at least, with the reputation that Roosevelt had as an opponent of monopoly capitalism. It's overblown, but it was definitely an image that people invested in. Roosevelt himself didn't discourage it. So we have lots of images of Roosevelt fighting anthropomorphized monopolies. So here's Roosevelt going after the, the, the Railroad Trust uh, as a wrestler. Um, we have lots of images uh, that I don't have in this PowerPoint presentation of, of Roosevelt hunting. So there are a, a variety of reform campaigns in addition to some anti-monopoly actions that Roosevelt took that were depicted as, as hunting uh, contests. So there's images of Roosevelt killing wolves that are, you know, kind of clumsily labeled as the post office, right? You know, we don't ordinarily think of the post office as a, as a wolf, but there was a big corruption scandal in the post office in the early 20th century, and Roosevelt tried to, um, uh, to, to undo those corruptions. Uh, and so you have images of Roosevelt fighting wolves, you have images of Roosevelt, um, you know, walking around with, with, with giant clubs, he's oversized, uh, he's he wielding a variety of, of, of weapons. But here again, you also have fearful images of Roosevelt. Roosevelt's militarism was something that a lot of cartoonists, anti-Roosevelt cartoonists, picked up on. Uh, so you hear, here you have Roosevelt as, a, as an assembly of weapons, cannons for eyes, uh, what do we got, uh, uh, bullets for teeth, uh, there's a sword there that comprises part of his hat. Uh, so, and, and it's not the same thing as Andrew Jackson treading upon the Constitution, but here you've got 
Roosevelt making the Constitution into a, a neckerchief of, of, of sorts. Um, Roosevelt's enthusiasm for war on display here as well. Here, Roosevelt, kind of oddly enough, is a, a cannon with revolvers for legs, brandishing swords and attacking Uncle Sam um, for some reason. Here's another one. Condemning Roosevelt for um, his, his militaristic enthusiasms. Uh, the, the satirical magazine Puck was um, a, a, a real um, kind of ground zero for uh, Rooseveltian imagery. Roosevelt appears in over 250 cartoons in that magazine from the 1880s through the end of World War I. Roosevelt himself dies uh, shortly after the, the Great War ends. Uh, Roosevelt's crusades against corruption, as I said, were, you know, they inspired all kinds of, um, uh, you know, uh, cartoonish uh, imagery. Uh, and, and again, the, the idea that you've got, you've got, two alternatives here. One in which Roosevelt is kind of a hero of the people upholding the Constitution. Uh, and on the other hand, you've got this sort of reckless figure brandishing the sword of, of militarism, uh, step, you know, stepping on the Constitution, again, in a sort of a, a, a mimicry of what we saw with, with Andrew Jackson. Lots of images of Roosevelt as a cowboy, kind of a centaur character uh, here. Uh, Roosevelt wrestling the railroad trusts, here depicted as a, as a bull. Um, so a lot of different images of, of Roosevelt there. Uh, and I think that those, those two characters, Roosevelt and Jackson, uh, are, are, are sort of useful for, for thinking about those, those kinds of tensions that I described uh, earlier and, and repeatedly now uh, between a, a president who is capable of defending the interests of the nation, one who uh, represents the energy that Alexander Hamilton believed was required uh, in the presidency. Uh, the, it is, you know, there's, there's a long trajectory that takes us from these political cartoons of Andrew Jackson and Theodore Roosevelt in the 19th and early 20th century to the images that I showed you at the start of this presentation. Uh, with presidents doing battle with monsters or presidents fighting, uh, you know, aggressive guerrillas. Um, but I, I think that Americans who lived in the era of Andrew Jackson would find a lot of these contemporary political images strangely familiar. We have some of the same fantasies and some of the same fears about presidential violence that are as old as the Republic. If we imagine the presidency as representing both democracy's heart as well as its avenging sword, the heroic and magical office that, uh, you know, was celebrated by its uh, proponents also endows its possessors with the title of the most powerful uh, man in the world. Not everyone is going to fit that bill equally well. There are reasons we don't have a lot of images of Calvin Coolidge or Jimmy Carter engaged in violent activities, although Carter did beat a rabbit with an oar. In <laughs> he was attacked by a rabbit. I don't know how else to describe this. He was on a, a fishing trip. I think this was in 1979. This is an unplanned tangent. So let's just roll with it. Um, and he, so he was out in this boat, and there was a rabbit, a swimming rabbit, which they don't really do. The rabbit starts swimming toward Carter's boat, and he was photographed uh, trying to, like, you know, shoo it away with, a, with an oar, which, you know, was positively ridiculous when it made its way into the press. But anyway, so we don't, we don't think of, you know, Jimmy Carter as, as a, a, you know, brandishing a sword of, of any kind, vengeful or, or, or otherwise. Um, but we have a lot of other presidents who have been looked upon as instruments for either national salvation or who have been looked upon as, as uh, you know, potentially uh, very dangerous characters.
Uh, and, and some of the obvious ones, as we've already seen, Andrew Jackson, Theodore Roosevelt. Lincoln is another character for whom violent images in his own era, as well as in our own era, are, are ubiquitous. Um, we saw images of Ronald Reagan and, and so on and, and so forth. So we, we continue in our political culture to imagine executives who are either liberators or who are potentially sources of, of, of tyranny. Um, and popular culture is one of the ways where, one of the, one of the venues where we're gonna work out these, um, these kinds of tensions. So I will, uh, I will leave it at that, having exceeded my planned quota by only six and a half minutes. Uh, and we'll take questions and hang out for a little bit longer. Thanks. So if you've got a question, I suppose, raise your hand. We've got microphones circulating. <laughs> first rule of Evening at Egan is <laughs> oh. don't talk about Evening at Egan. <laughs> this is your first night at Evening at Egan. You have to fight. So. Maybe an easy question about Harry Truman having to drop a, a atomic bomb or two. Any, any thoughts on that with? Yeah, there, the, uh, I've got a chapter on presidents and nuclear weapons in here. And, and there's, there's a little bit about Truman. Um, I, I'm, I'm dredging some, some fading uh, memories here because it's been a few years since I worked on that particular section. Um, but if, if memory serves, there, there was a, 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 what would you call it, a docudrama that was made um, that, that did attempt to uh, represent, it used an actor playing Harry Truman, sort of in silhouette, uh, ruminating over the decision to drop the bomb. Um, uh, Curiously, if you remember the images I showed you at the start with you know, Ronald Reagan with nuclear weapons sort of coming out of his mouth or Reagan's giant head as a nuclear warhead or Reagan as a cowboy blowing up Europe, um, you don't find those kinds of images of, of Harry Truman for, for reasons that I'm not sure I have any sophisticated explanation for. Um, uh, Truman certainly tried to bring the focus of that decision-making on himself. Historians who have studied the Manhattan Project and the decisions that were made about targeting have basically been arguing for years that Truman had very, very little to do with it. Um, but it's always referred to, or it was always referred to as Truman's decision. Um, you know, so he brought the focus on himself for that. But in terms of you know, representations of Truman in popular culture, there's not a whole lot of the kind of things that we're seeing here, which, which I think is, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's an anomaly because, you know, certainly he did preside over uh, whether he was responsible for all the decision making or not. He, he, he did preside over, at least symbolically, um, one, of, one of the greatest acts of violence in, in human history. Um, you know, why we don't have images of Truman doing any of these things that we have images of, you know, some of the other presidential characters doing, I don't, I don't have a great I don't have a great explanation for. In your opinion, uh, who would win the knife fight? <laughs> um, I'm not sure I have an opinion. I'll tell you what, what, the, what the consensus seems to be, and this probably won't surprise anybody. Most of the, the, the folks who tried to come up with an answer turned either to Jackson, Lincoln, Roosevelt or Eisenhower. Those were the four that, that tended to sift to the top. Every now and then someone would, would you know, come out of left field and try to argue that Millard Fillmore <laughs> would wind up at the top of the heap or uh, you know, maybe someone might sneak in through the back door and you know, perhaps you might, like Lyndon Johnson was someone that, that, that every now and then someone would say, well, you know, the guy was like 6'4". He was, he was big, um, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know if I have a good, a good answer. <laughs>
So if I look at the violent in images that you put up in the beginning, they seem much more personal in the sense of a duel, fight, people caning one another, whatever else. And if you think of our popular culture of violent images, let's say of the Obama administration with drones, it seems to me there's a lot bigger, there's distancing in a sense, or uh, Trump uh, talking about, you know, sort of taking the, the police in a distance in a, you know, another town that they sort of giving them permission to violent or on the border or something. Do you have any comments about that? It, has it changed a little bit in terms of this, how we view this violent? Yeah, I mean, I think it is a good distinction because, you know, just talk about nuclear weapons, right? Like, there, there are, or, or torture, you know, so I've I got a chapter on torture in there. And, and, and so the, the representations of presidents as, as being individually responsible for violence, that becomes one way to, um, I, think, I think, make very clear connections between the individual who holds the office and the decisions that are carried out you know, at, 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 at his behest, uh, at least up to now, at, at his behest. Um, so the torture images, right? You, the, the, the the images of, of George W. Bush in um, you know like a like a torturer's mask or you know carrying a cat of nine tails. I mean that that's a, that's a way of of making the policy of torture into you know something very personal. You know that, that Bush himself is responsible for it. So it, it's it go, it's more than just Grover Cleveland, you know, pulling the trap door. Uh, or Andrew Jackson killing a guy in a duel. It's a, it is a different sort of uh, sort of thing. Um, so I, is is that kind of what you're yeah, you like getting at? Yeah, yeah, and and of course, I mean, if you look at the powers that presidents have accumulated over you know the last two centuries. Um, they, they've got a, a, a staggering array of, of, of actual real-world violent uh, instruments at their disposal, drones, nuclear weapons, uh, policies that, you know, can lead to someone being snatched uh, off the streets in, you know, the remote part of the world and, and hauled off to Guantanamo Bay or Bagram uh, Air Base in Afghanistan. So, uh, so, the, so, the, so the actual powers of the presidency have, have certainly accumulated a, a, a lot of, of, of debris uh, over the years. Uh, and I think that that, it, that, that, is, that is certainly one reason, I think, that in our own cultural moment, those images, some of them very whimsical and ironic, are everywhere. It, it is, it, I, I'm not like, I don't do a whole lot of psychoanalysis in my my work, but there there is something meaningful about a, a a culture that has all these popular images of presidents being violent, and a political system in which the the violence of empire is uh, pretty wide ranging. Um, and, and you and in order, I mean, you you can you can critique it in all kinds of ways. Uh, but you know the, the magic of, of culture is it allows you to fuse things together very quickly. Uh, so if you want to you know critique torture, there are a lot of ways to do that very eloquently in you know in, in, you know uh, at, at great length. Uh, or you can just put George Bush and Dick Cheney into a, you know a, a medieval kind of of dungeon and it, it, it dramatizes it in a way that um, you know uh, is, is is useful at making those kinds of points about the the structural violence that they have um, and, and and the distance that they have from it. Uh, I don't know if anybody saw the um, uh, the film about Cheney. Uh, what was it called Vice? Uh, there's a, there's a great scene in there in which a, a, a young Gurr, Donald Rumsfeld, and a young Dick Cheney are hovering outside uh, an office in the White House where Nixon and Kissinger are meeting, and Rumsfeld says to Cheney, you know what's happening behind that door over there? There are two guys having a conversation, and as a result of that conversation, uh, sometime in the next couple days, a village in Cambodia is going to be obliterated. Um, that's the kind of, of distance, uh, and you know, in that film, you know, there's there's a way that 
that distance is bridged, um, uh, you know, for the, for the audience. So, anyway, that was a long-winded response, John. But as a former chancellor, you deserve a long-winded response. <laughs> Here's a short-winded question. <laughs> Do you think that uh, the circumstances of the time uh, influence <clears throat> how these uh, presidents are going to present themselves? In other words, if you had a, Andrew Jackson in a very placid time, or I can't come up with any other circumstances, but <clears throat> do they bring their personalities and their inclinations to whatever the scene is? Yeah, I think so, and I, I, and I think there's a reason why it's, it's sort of a limited range of presidential characters who are serviceable in, in those kinds of images. Um, much as I said a few minutes ago, everyone kind of commenting on that knife fight hypothetical, it all tends to kind of filter down to a couple of different contenders. Um, you know, we have, most of our presidents are pretty inconspicuous, pretty nondescript um, and, and so all throughout the 19th century if you if, if you look at the kind of again to use Hamilton's phrase energy that presidents bring into the office most of them don't seek an energetic uh, tenure um, Jackson very convinced that the presidency should be the seat of, of great power he argued that the president was the only office who was elected by all the people, and so it was his job to defend the interests of all the people. So he had a very aggrandized vision of what the office ought to be. Other presidential characters uh, didn't, and, and they, they, they more or less bided their time as quietly as they possibly could and allowed Congress to do most of the legislating and uh, allowed their, their cabinet to do most of the... Uh, the decision making. Um, so the, the fact that you have a certain and a, a very small subset of presidents over the years who uh, you know are associated with with vigorous kinds of policy making and presidents like Lincoln who happen to come into office at a time when everything is going to hell um, that almost forces Lincoln into a position where he's going to be depicted uh, certainly by Confederates as, you know, as a, as a violent threat to their interests, as a king, uh, as an ape, uh, as, as, a, as a beast. Um, uh, so, so sometimes it's by virtue of circumstance, in Lincoln's case. Uh, other times it's, you know, by force of character. Uh, Jackson and Roosevelt are, are two guys who are really eager for the limelight in, in different ways. Um, so I, I, I don't know if that's answering the, the, the question, but yeah, certainly the, 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 the contingencies of the, the president and the contingencies of the historical moment are going to have a lot to do with whether or not they get depicted in violent uh, ways. So I didn't fully think how I was going to word this, but... Um, I see memes far more than I see political cartoons nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just wondering if you consider those a branch off of political cartoons and oh, yeah. whether or not you think they carry the same like political weight or political impact as political cartoons did um, back in their prime, I guess. Oh, absolutely. Uh, um, and, and this gives me a good opportunity to plug a course I'm teaching in the spring on social media and history, because yeah, I mean, the, 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 the memes that circulate on Facebook and Twitter are shaping our political and historical discourse in ways that I, I think absolutely um, rival, if not exceed, the force that political cartoons once had. Um, uh, so I think that, that that's that that's a very good question, and and yes, indeed, in, in parts of this project, especially the the ones that deal with, say, you know, the presidencies of, you know, Bush, Obama, and the the current um, occupant, um, uh, there's gonna be a lot of stuff with with, with memes there, uh, you know, like user generated. Uh, uh, you know, digital images, manipulate, photoshopping. Um, there's there's a, a, an almost impossible volume of material for for these later uh, chapters. So so yeah, thanks, Ashley. 
think we had a question up here too. Go back. Um, I'd just like to hear you say more about what you think that these images are doing for us. Because if I'm thinking of, of Bush, for example, where oftentimes the, the Bush administration was saying, you know, the U.S. does not torture, Rumsfeld would you know, continue to, to go back to, you know, these are just some, some bad apples. And then the, the image of, of, of Bush as a medieval torturer was contesting that. And other times it seems that we want to have our presidents really, uh, to imagine them as warriors. I remember um, Dukakis, for example, with, the, with the, the helmet and the tank was thought to be the point at which um, his, president, uh, his chances to be president died. Um, so can you say something about that, about, when, about what uh, viewing the president um, as a as a warrior does for us as a culture? I, I think a couple of things. Um, you know, one point that's sort of lurking beneath the surface of all of this is that um, whether images of presidential violence are coming from a, a, a place of concern or whether they are coming from a place of, of um, of need for you know some strong figure they, they they reinforce to the extent that that violence is gendered in our culture they reinforce the the underlying presumption that um, that the presidency is a, a, a by default a masculine institution so uh, so there there are some uh, you know if you think about the you know the, the notion of a knife fight yeah it's it's really really funny in, in a way until you think a about uh, you know what, what's what's not put at the surface of that, uh, which is the you know the gendered assumptions, um, and and the, the uh, it's not my phrase, but the uh, there's an historian named uh, Iris Young who calls this the the logic of masculinist protection. Um, you know the the way that we've we've constructed certain institutions including the presidency uh, along the lines of, of you know needing a, a powerful paternal figure uh, to to defend a republic which is often kind of imagined in in, in, in you know gendered feminine terms um, so 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 that's one thing that these images I think do is that they uh, they reflect a, a certain you know kind of default um, uh, uh, gender politic, uh, or, you know, uh, gendered um, ideology about the presidency. Um, uh, I don't know, does that does that help? Uh, yeah, that's one thing. I think they, they, they do they do a lot of things, and I, you know, I alluded to one other um, one other thing earlier. I think that they they provide a kind of shorthand for uh, for the kind of critique that you're you're alluding to. Um, uh, but I think they, they also, you know, they, they, they reflect, certainly over the last couple of decades, you know, our, the, 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 um, our, our image of the presidency has really altered as a result of, say, the American war in Vietnam, Watergate, a variety of other scandals with the suffix gate attached to them over the years. Um, you know, the, the presidency has been demystified in a lot of ways. You can get on Twitter right now and tell the president of the United States to, to shove it, you know. There, so there, there is something that has altered in the relationship that, you know, uh, political subjects have with, with the presidency over the years. And I think to the extent that the presidency has been demystified, yeah, then you can start playing around with it. Like, you know, you don't find images of George Washington fighting zombies um, until you get into, a, a, you know, an historical period where, you know, the presidency has, uh, you know, uh, the power of the presidency has, has been sort of exposed. Individual presidents have been um, kind of, uh, you know, dethroned, uh, you know, so I, so I think that those, those images reflect, uh, 
a, a kind of, uh, I don't know, it's, it's cynicism is the wrong term, but a, a kind of ironic distance from the presidency. Um, it, it, it's, it, it reflects a, um, a, a, kind of, a kind of mass disappointment in a way with, uh, with the office. Any other questions? All right, I think, I think we're done then. You're free to go, thanks.